and engaging discussion today. God bless you. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules uh, to be with us today. And before we start, I am going to just open up in prayer. Uh, there will be some preliminary um, things that I will be going through, and then we're going to welcome our distinguished panelists and uh, enjoy what they have to say today um, in view of what we'll be discussing. Father, we thank you for the opportunity today to be part of a body of people where you provide the uh, ministers and especially the men in the midst today to be able to uh, be like my darkness and you said the entrance of your word gives light. So thank you Lord for the opportunity to be able to engage and to listen. We want you to be getting the glory and for the people to be edified. And so we praise you today in everything that we do. And we pray more than all that the spirit of the Lord will be present in all that we engage in today. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Okay. Amen. Amen. My name is Valerie Sims, and I will be your facilitator stroke or slash moderator for this particular session. Okay, today we have some distinguished um, panel members that I'm going to introduce, and I will do uh, a little bit more of an introduction in terms of bio um, presently, but let me just say this to begin with. Um, so we have Pastor Joseph Daly. Can you just wave at us, uh, Pastor Daly? Praise the Lord. <laughs> we have Reverend Dr. Frank Douglas. Can you give us a wave, please? <laughs> Praise God. And Reverend uh, Dr. Reddy, can you wave too? Thank Lord you. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Bless Praise you, bless the Lord. And last but not least, Pastor Andre Sims Morgan. I don't see you on camera. Um, if you could come on camera and give us a wave, that would be good. If, you, if that's not possible now, then we're going to. Okay, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. All right, we're good. Okay, matters on the discussion today. Today, we will be discussing some questions that have been submitted by the Kingdom Praying Women 365. And I will be interchangeably sometimes saying KPW 365, other times I may say Kingdom Praying Women. So if I do say KPW, it just represents the Kingdom Praying Women. Welcome to the women all around, all the women on today. Praise God, wanting to hear yeah. from these great men of God who are going to help us in some of the areas. And the discussions that we're going to be undertaking, we did get a lot of questions, as you can imagine, and we naturally had to kind of like confine for the interest of time to what we can do within um, the period that we have today. So if your question's not being answered today, don't worry, sometime in the future, I'm sure we will be able to circle back to those questions. So we're going to be looking at Christian social, social ethics, women and leadership, the role of women in marriage. Now, disclaimer. These questions have been submitted today by the KPW ladies in their raw or original form. So they've not been formatted, they've not been edited. So we're just going to give you the questions just as people have asked them. And um, so be mindful of that. The panelists are not representing any church organization in this context. The answers given will be within a biblical framework and not a church framework. And uh, this is not a slight or bias against anybody's church organization or their beliefs, the answers will be based on biblical truths and not on church ideo ideology and or opinion. For the purposes of this session, there should be no perceived 
or intended discrimination or bias against any group, gender, politics, sexuality, religious affiliation. Uh, that, that just should be a disclaimer for everybody listening today. And I just want to set out some brief house rules for us. Um, for the purpose of the virtual assembly that we have today and all the platforms and everybody streaming in, um, it's still one of respect. And we'd like you to be courteous and to respect the privacy of others. And if you do need to make any comments and we welcome you to do that, um, please um, put those in the chat feature, but please be mindful um, of how we write and let's just be respectful of each other. The chances of us taking live questions today will be, I would say, slim to none. So we will probably just be engaging the questions that we have on hand. Okay. Now let me move to our introductions. First, and I've tried to do this in a fair way so that there's no hierarchy or anybody feel that they've been um, put in an order and they're not sure. So I'm going to do this in alpha order. For our British folks who are very familiar with the alphabetical order, I'm not sure what, what that would be here in the North American context. So first up will be Pastor Joseph Daly. And this is just an excerpt of his bio. And uh, let me say that for everybody, it's just an excerpt. And um, these gentlemen have bios as long as your arms. So I couldn't stay to read it all. So we're just gonna give you a snippet today. All right, so Pastor Joseph um, Daly was born in London in the UK. He moved to Jamaica as a teen where he became a Christian in the Assemblies of God, Westmoreland, Jamaica. Later, he moved to the Good News Release Center where he was instrumental in church planting and missionary endeavors. He became a licensed evangelist in Manchester, Jamaica and other parishes and following on with pastoral and national positions in this church. After his return to the UK in 2010, he trained as a chaplain and is currently serving as a lay minister at Park Lane Christian Center. He has preached in the UK, Jamaica, Canada, and the USA. He's married to Myrna, has one son and four adopted children. And his desire is to fulfill his God-given purpose and reach as many souls as possible for Christ. So that's Pastor Daly. And let's move on. Our next panelist, the next panelist is Reverend Dr. Dr. Frank Douglas. He is an experienced lead pastor with exceptional skills in public speaking, biblical preaching, teaching, motivational speaking, theology, discipleship, pastoral counseling, mentoring, and volunteer management. He is a strong professional with an earned Doctor of Ministry degree from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary with the Leaders of Leaders. He's a seasoned minister and conference speaker and holds many positions of responsibility. He is married to Jacqueline, has two sons and one daughter. He has the prerequisite for cutting edge ministry and is current in terms of leadership and marketplace ministry. So this is Reverend Dr. Douglas. Okay, next on our panelists is Dr. D.A. Reddy. Dr. Reddy is an adjunct professor senior researcher and lecturer of mathematics and geography. Just saying that makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
<laughs> he has over four decades of local and international academia. Dr. Reddy has helped set up schools in Jamaica and Canada. He's a justice of the peace, an associate pastor, spiritual advisor, and mentor. He is a published author of, I think, around six books. I may be wrong. And the list of accomplishments are as long as your own. He's married to fellow doctoral spouse, uh, Dr. Gloria, with two adult children and two grandchildren, Reverend Dr. Reddy. And he is an exceptional gift to the body of Christ. Right, last but not least is Pastor Andre Sims Morgan, raised in the Church of God of Prophecy under the tutelage of his late grandfather, Elder Jacob Sims. Andre experienced the call of God at a young age, preaching and doing lots of ministry and called the church boy, bishop from his peers and family. He's used every opportunity to grow and develop in the service of the Lord. He moved to the firstborn church of the living God in 1998 and continued to pursue God even harder. In 2003, he coordinated his first conference and has done many other events since. He's a national coordinator for his um, church, the firstborn church lead pastor in Bilston, West Midlands. And that was a new mission that was started in 2012. With God's help, they are growing. He's well known internationally, has ministered in Canada, the UK, Jamaica, and the USA. He's married to Melody with one lively son. His heart's desire is to fulfill the great commission on his life and dare to be God's man in these last days. So there you have it, Pastor Andre Sims Morgan. And I believe those are all our panelists for today. So we are now, I've done all the preliminaries as far as I know. And um, so we are ready to go and to ask some questions. But before we do that, can I just ask the gentleman just to say a brief hi to all of our listeners right around the world. So maybe you want to go in alphabetical order. So pa Pastor Daly, could you just say hi, please? Uh, greetings, everybody, in the precious name of Jesus. It is a privilege in sharing with you this afternoon, and I'm giving God thanks for the wonderful opportunity um, as to all of these questions, in God we trust, and upon God we depend. These are some very hard and complex questions, and we may not agree on the answers, but nevertheless, uh, we will try our best. And I, I have been praying about this and asking the Lord to give divine direction. So we will rely on the Holy Spirit's leading and divine direction. May God bless you. And we trust that we will be a blessing to you and a help to you. God bless you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you very much, Pastor Daly. And moving on to Reverend Dr. Douglas, if you could just say a brief hi to us, that would be great. Good morning from Canada. I know it is afternoon, evening, and even night for many of you in different parts of the world, but it's good morning for me. I'd like to honor uh, Minister Marcia Sims Patrick and her team. And of course, the panelists, my distinguished panelists today, thank you for allowing me to be on this panel today, honoring the Lord uh, with the gifts God, that God has given to us. Uh, when I was asked to minister in this forum and I was told that it's a forum that ministered uh, very heavily towards women, I said, yes, I enjoy such areas of ministry. Let me give credit to Minister Marcia Sims Patrick for five years of ministry in an incredible, incredible role of ministering to women around the world. May the Lord bless you. I say to my fellow panelists, as we minister to people and lives around the world, that will God will get the glory in all that we do. Bear in mind, listeners, we do not have all the answers. Our guide 
the word of God. And so on. <laughs> be blessed. Thank you, yes. Dr. Douglas. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Dr. Reddy, brief hello, please. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. My, my dear wife will tell you that when I am allowed to introduce myself, I simply say, I am a sinner whom Christ has rescued. <laughs> that's, that's my preferred form of introduction. I look forward to being of help with some of these questions, God assisting me. They are very pertinent, very up to date, and I hope I shall be able to help in ratifying some of these issues for the kingdom of God and for his glory. Um, the number five is, is significant. It's of sacred and, 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 and mystical importance. And so uh, consider it a milestone of some sort, the first of or uh, one of many to come. I too would like to commend um, Minister Marcia and of course her beloved sisters and the families and, and friends and team around her. Um, many hands, of course, make work light and, and no man is an island and uh, everybody working together will eventually make this a great ministry. That's my prophecy. So thank you very much for the privilege and the honor. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Uh, Pastor Andre, can you just say a brief hi, please? Greetings to you all, and um, good afternoon, um, or good morning, good day, whatever time of day it is, wherever you are. Um, let me say it is an honor and a privilege to be on this panel. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very honored, to be honest, um, to be on this panel with such, um, such a great company. Um, I trust and I pray that we will be able to go through these questions. A lot of them are very um, deep. Um, and as Pastor George said, we may not always, um, we may not agree. Um, however, um, we pray that we, uh, there'll be edification at the end of this. And at the end of this, everybody will be blessed. And also let me um, also congratulate the team, uh, the uh, administrators and everybody that works and behind the scenes on KPW365. It's a wonderful ministry and is growing from strength to strength. And may the Lord continue to bless as you continue to do great exploits for the Lord. Amen. Okay, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. As you can see, can we just give them a virtual hand clap? Wonderful. And uh, we're going to just jump in to the first question. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm probably going to, some of them I may direct, and so I will read the question and I may say a name, and that indicates that I, I would probably like that person um, to give their thoughts first. And then if anybody has anything else to add, um, then that's fine too. Okay, and we're going to try and keep time in mind. So the first question will be for Dr. Douglas. And it will be, where does the body of Christ stand on having a child through surrogacy? And this kind of links to another one that says, where do we stand on artificial insemination? Muted. Thank you, uh, Sister Valerie, for the question. As was stated earlier, uh, these are very challenging questions. These are social ethics questions. And these are questions by and large, although we endeavor to answer these questions from a biblical perspective, some things are not explicitly stated in scripture. So how do we respond to questions such as these that are social ethics questions, Christian ethics questions, and questions that are not specifically stated in scripture? Let me quickly add that at this stage, uh, beyond our panel and beyond the answer I'll give, I'll ask you to consult scripture. And I'll also, again, at different points, make reference to written material on research that has been done by academics, Christian academics, professors, uh, biblical scholars in areas to help us in this regard. For further information, you may see Minister 
Marcia Sims Patrick. So the issue of surrogacy. The issue of sur I'll ask you to consult your Marcia Sims Patrick. Go ahead, Dr. Frank. Surrogacy. I'm getting a feedback. It is something that we've seen. The question of surrogacy is something that we've seen raised in scripture, but not in the context that we see it today. So let me give a quick overview of surrogacy and from the point of view of the biblical perspective and then the ethics. Surrogacy is what we first uh, saw in the issue between Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. As we study scripture in the book of Genesis, and if we follow the account of Genesis chapter 12 all the way through and follow the lineage, and at the time, the different events that were taking place in the region and in the context of which these were taking place, if we go back to the story of Abraham, God had given him the promise. Of course, his wife, Sarah, suggests that uh, why don't you, in this regard, take the step of making a child, for lack of a better term, with my servant, Hagar. That is possibly one of the first incidents of the, or the idea of surrogacy that we've seen in scripture. Now, from the point of view that this was suggested and it's recorded in scripture, does that mean it was, because it's recorded in scripture, it was something to be done as is? So let me quickly, without becoming complicated or difficult, as biblical teachers and preachers of the word, we must differentiate between what's called prescriptive and descriptive. Prescriptive would be what is prescribed as what we have seen, what thus says the Lord, God specifically says. Descriptive is what we see in scripture as what is listed through a narrative, such as the account in Abraham's life. When we study the text in Abraham's life, we see the descript descriptive approach of Sarah giving Hagar, giving Abraham permission to have a child with Hagar. In this regard, that is descriptive. There is no prescriptive approach to this from the biblical perspective. How then do we approach this from the perspective of ethics, Christian ethics, and from the perspective of applying this to our lives. First and foremost, we must understand the motivation behind surrogacy. Without getting technical, there are many aspects to reproductive technologies that are being utilized today. In the, in the case of children coming into the world, the biblical perspective for which children should come into the world is according to God's divine design. In Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 28, the scripture made it, made it very clear that God brought to his creative order, Adam and Eve into the world. He made it clear that they should be fruitful and multiply. So what happens when there are challenges of infertility or other concerns? And there are many, many reasons for surrogacy to come into the picture. The scripture clearly declares that marriage should be a relationship between the husband and wife. Genesis chapter two, verse 18 to 25, lays out the framework. In the biblical context in the New Testament, as it relates to children, the role of human sexuality, Paul outlines this in 1 Corinthians chapter seven and makes it clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 as to how those relationships should flow. When we look at scripture in light of the biblical context, scripture does not specifically outline outside of the role of human interaction 
vis-a-vis -vis human sexuality, procreation. So scripture supports the notion of procreation as opposed to reproduction. Now, let me quickly distinct, give the distinctives between the two. Procreation involves the coming together of male and female, man and woman, as in the context of the biblical union of marriage, where the male and female gametes come together, there's conception and that child is formed, developed in the womb. That is the context of procreation as we see in scripture. Reproduction that as we have noticed today has become very common through reproductive technologies. Reproduction then becomes the use of science, medicine, medical technology to facilitate conception outside of the womb. Now, you and I must understand that the wisdom of God given to produce and preserve life and not in all contexts should be taken as is. So then we do understand that medical technology can be very positive. We're facing a pandemic. At this point, medical technology has been used and it has been used to sustain life. In the context of surrogacy, surrogacy as it relates to the biblical context is not prescribed in scripture. From a descriptive perspective and an application perspective, the context of a husband and wife in what is called artificial insemination through husband wife interaction in some context, you may find some theologian and biblical scholars will agree that it is permissible in the context of a husband wife scenario. There are many scenarios which are too numerous to mention. And so from a biblical perspective, let me quickly summarize surrogacy is not prescribed in scripture. It has been described through the Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar interaction. And I do not give a specific account. I want you to read Genesis chapter 11, all the way to Genesis chapter 50. And you will see the flow through as to in that instance, as to the negative responses that flow through. So in the, if surrogacy ought to be utilized in the context of a applicable way, it would be best done through a loving, nurturing, caring relationship of husband and wife from that perspective. Now, let me quickly add to that once again, that is from a perspective of ethics. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. Um, I see from that you're saying that um, surrogacy is more of a descriptive rather than a pre prescriptive, and that um, it, it's really advisable for um, people that want to have a family for this to be done within the context of husband and wife. Yes. I and let, that. Yes, and let me quick to add to that, even in that context, because there's several other issues, and because of time, the issue of what do we do with the embryos? What happens to the embryos that are not used? Remember, God in his divine design, Genesis 1, 26, 1, 26 to 28, the image of God, all human life has value because the image of God has been formed in all human beings and must be preserved, whether it is the embryonic stage, fetus, whether it is in the stage of gametes, whether it is in the stage of the adult, it must be considered. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Douglas. I see that Pastor Daly would like to give his input and you're welcome to, uh, to give that now. Thank you very much. Um, that Dr. Frank has really given a, a quite a, a, a detailed response to the question and um, I would say I would fully agree with the um, response given. But I just wanted to share a little perspective from a person who was actually a product of reproductive technology. And this question was forwarded to uh, Pastor John um, Piper in the United States. 
And I'm just gonna read the question, not really to answer the question, but just to give you a perspective of some of the results of reproductive technology. So it says this, Pastor John, I was conceived using the sperm of an anonymous donor. My parents who are believers wanted a child very badly, but my father was infertile. So they chose to purchase sperm from a fertility, fertility clinic. My biological donor father was paid to give his sperm to the clinic. My parents chose not to tell me about my conception until after I was married. When I was told I was shocked and hurt, I struggled to find my identity for years. I rest in the thought that God is my father. I'm always drawn to scriptures and songs about God as father to help settle my confused heart. At least 60,000 children are born through donor conception every year in the United States. So I know this is impacting local churches, though it is rarely discussed. Reproductive technology is moving fast and couples can choose to purchase sperm or eggs from a more fertile person or use the embryos left over from others who are made more who have made more embryos than they wanted. My questions are twofold. Does God desire some couples to remain childless to the point that using the sperm or eggs of a third person is resistance to his will? And do you have any scripture or any grace for those of us who are the product of reproductive technology who feel a bit like we were sold off as a commodity and abandoned by a biological parent in order to make another family happy. Mm -hmm. well, um, from that question, you see some of the unfortunate um, repercussions of reproductive technology. This person, unfortunately, was not told from her childhood that she was a product of reproductive technology. And as a result, it caused her quite a bit of pain. So I fully agree with what Dr. Frank said regarding keeping it within the context of a loving family relationship and also making sure that you communicate with the person if that does happen, because it can cause quite a bit of pain. And let's face it that the, the context in which Abraham and Sarah did it, it did cause some pain for Hagar. It caused quite a bit of pain. So I just wanted to let that point come across that there are some, um, some possibly in, possible incidences of hurt that can occur from this kind of practice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor Daly. And thank we can thank see, you. We, just... we could spend an awful long time on this and not really be able to interact with our other questions, but we can really see based on the first um, answer from Dr. Douglas and from um, this point that has been brought up from Pastor Daly, how important it is um, talking about reproductive and um, technology and what's prescriptive and what's descriptive. And I think it was the Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul that said all things are something, but not all things are lawful, something like that. So what I'm saying is, is that um, just because um, a product is out there doesn't necessarily mean that we have to avail ourselves of it. When you listen, 60,000 children born annually as a result of somebody deciding that they would like to add to their family. And we would say that's noble. Somebody wants to add. Um, and they, they want to have children. But when you listen on the back end, that person saying, I want to add to my family, but somebody else on the back end is hurt because especially if they're not notified. So really this is like very deep. We could spend all our time on this, but I do appreciate that. And um, the other two gentlemen, I'm not gonna call you in on this question because I'm sure there's something else that you will be able to, um, to, to give your opinion on. Actually, our next question, 
Um, going back to what Pastor Daly said, where um, he re- the, 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 the question said, does God want some people to remain without children? And uh, the question I'm going to ask now may, um, uh, it, it's to do with being single. So does God want some people to remain single? That's just something, that's not the question, but this is just something uh, to percolate uh, in, in your mind. Okay, let's go to our next question, which will be presented to Pastor Andre. And um, anyone um, that wants to, from the panel, that wants to add to this is also welcome, bearing in mind our time. So this question states, there are many of our women in church who are single and it's not by choice. Is there anything biblical that suggests they shouldn't be using alternative ways to meet people such as online, speed dating, and the many aspects that are out there, swipe right or left or whatever it is you can do these days. Okay, so over to Pastor Andre. Let's see if we can get some contribution in this area. Okay, wow. Okay, this is a a deep one. Um, Women in the church, the single, uh, not by choice. Okay, um, we're going to see biblical suggestions to use any alternative ways um, to meet someone. Um, I haven't found anything in the scripture to say that anything, you know, that it is wrong. Um, personally speaking, um, I I know of different reformations, and I know we're not talking about different churches, however, but I know of different churches that do put on different events and different things in order for single people to interact and yeah. to meet each other, um, such as like speed dating and stuff like that. And I personally, I would say there is nothing wrong with it as long as um you set the right boundaries and you keep your integrity um about you and just do things in the right and proper way um that's my perception on it i haven't found anything scriptural um i don't know if dr douglas or dr reddy could help on that or, or pastor george could help on that um i haven't found anything in scripture in saying that there's anything wrong with it, but I would say that you've just got to know how to keep the boundaries, set boundaries in that sort of sense and know how you're, you're doing, doing things in the Thank right you, way. Pastor Andre. So gentlemen, uh, that was really short and to the point. So to anybody point. else, <laughs> uh, any of our other panelists that would like to um, chime in and say something there? May I speak? Yes, you may. Okay. Um, uh, I just want to say that I I don't want to be talking too much, please. Um, (laughs) (laughs) You're on the wrong forum for not speaking. (laughs) I just want to say this. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7 says, Be careful for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Prayer is exceedingly important in seeking a spouse. There can be, although the Bible does not specifically say anything about speed dating and online dating and that sort of thing. But there can be dangers. There can be dangers. You do not always know who you're getting. There can be people who hide their identities, who hide behind the screens and that sort of thing. And um, online dating can be quite a disappointment for some people. So I would say, pray about everything. And you will hear me say this perhaps throughout this afternoon for many of these questions. 
prayer is exceedingly important. Ask God. And I, I, I don't want to take up all the time, but my marriage was ordained by God. God not only set the, the, the um, gave me the spouse, but he set the date for me. He gave me the date. And at the time when he told me that I'm to be married, I wasn't even ready. All I had in the bank was 70 Jamaican dollars. All I had in my earthly possessions was a bed. But that God did it. I had three months to get married according to what God said. And I told God, I'm not borrowing. I'm not begging. I'm not stealing. And God provided everything I had. I invited all the churches in our fellowship. By faith, I just invited all of them. I said, God, you said it. So I'm just going to invite everybody to come. And, and they did come. <laughs> they were all fed. And at the end of it all, I was blessed. I had two barrels of appliances and lo lots of thousands of pounds, um, thousands of dollars in gifts. And God provide. I'm just saying, pray. And God will direct you to the right person at the right time. Pray about it. God bless you. Uh, can I just... Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Reddy. No, no, I, I, just two things. One of the first things I want to do is to commend uh, Pastor Andre for his honesty and his forthrightness. Uh, Paul, when he was confronted with certain issues, if you read 1 Corinthians 7, I think it's verse uh, uh, 6 and 12, he says, really, I, I, I have not got this on any authority. I don't know what the precedents are, but this is my opinion. Paul always, you read those two verses, Corinthians 7, 6 and 12. Paul always clarified that this is my opinion, but it's not necessarily what I've had handed down from the Lord. And that's very good honesty. Um, you might know by now that I am from the old school and I, you know, we have this virtual world and the real world. And I would much prefer if we continue, <laughs> call me out moded or outdated, like, but like uh, the pastor what Daly was saying, I prefer if we continue to operate within the domains and the confines of the real world in so far as this issue is concerned. Because what speed dating does is to open up the window to the, the darker underworld and where there are all sorts of evils lurking and so forth. So I, I would prefer we steer on the the side of the real world and remain within that confines in so far as meeting people are concerned. My own dear wife was introduced to me by uh, a beloved pastor who is now passed on, God bless his soul. And so that's how it works. You get to know people in the real world through the right circles. Uh, so that's what I would like to say. Be careful of the virtual world. Too much is too much is hidden within that those confines. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And um, just to wrap up on on that particular question, unless oh, Doctor Douglas, go ahead. Yes, I'd like to quickly read a a, a verse from uh, a very well known passage, and it is Second Timothy chapter two, verse twenty two. And I'm going to read from the NLT, the New Living Translation, for the purposes of easier understanding. If I were going to do an exegetical assessment of this, I would take a more direct or word-for-word -word reading. But the New Living Translation states, run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Now, from, a pers from the perspective of the culture in which we live, almost every service that's out there that is involved in the virtual. World, human connectivity relationships, and I won't call any names. Almost, or we do understand we do understand that human pleasure, when put as the first and number one purpose for our existence, especially for Christian 
young people, singles or whomever, it can become very difficult. So keep the context from a biblical perspective, perspective Paul says to Timothy in instructing the next generation, be careful how you pursue this. Okay, thank you. Um, and those were like fairly clear answers from all of our panelists. Um, really, that uh, it starts at um, if you are going to um, engage in um, online um, dating and matters of, of, of that respect, then you really need to have some boundaries. You need to walk in integrity. And as was said as well, second to um, Timothy 2.22, that we need to be careful about what we do. We need to pray and we need to keep it in the real world as far as possible so we don't find ourselves mired in anything that we're going to have challenges with afterwards. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. So I don't know about time, but we're going to see whether we can roll through some more stuff here. All right, this question is going out to Dr. Reddy. Dr. Reddy, are you ready? <laughs> I like that I'm a comedian, you didn't know it. <laughs> okay, what about if um, a woman's been abused, raped, and there is a child as a product of this, or maybe incest? Can you give us some insight on that? Uh, if the woman has been abused or if there was incest, abused, uh -huh. raped, or there was incest and there is a child as a result of that. Oh, okay, I presume the, 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 the person who was asked the question is desirous of knowing whether um, in that case abortion is legitimized or, or, or becomes legitimate. Um, again, it's, I will speak like Pastor Andre has spoken, I will give my opinion and then say what I believe the Bible has to say about that. Um, I think one of the previous panelists said all, all life is ordained by God, has come from God, is a product of love, even though in that case one party did not consent. But life is sacred. Part of the problems we have today is with um, society globally not accepting the sanctity of blood and the sacredness of life. And I believe that um, abortion, the termination of um, pregnancy, for whatever the reason, whatever the reason, in my opinion, and I believe I will be able to support that from a scriptural point of view, I believe it is a total taboo. And I, I, I say this too, even with people asking, well, what do you do with a child if you find that um, before birth, you find that it is um, plagued with some um, defects or abnormalities? I said, you, you bring the child in the world that is a challenge for you to practice the love that God has endowed you with. It is to test your own faith and your own devotion to the principles of love and devotion and patience and long suffering. So I believe that uh, regardless of the circumstances and although we, we would want to be um, sympathetic in, in those cases, I, I would totally disagree with any form of termination. A child is a gift from God irrespective of circumstances, needs to be brought into the world, given the same love and nurture and care as you would any other child. That's my, um, that's my view, and I believe it is supported by scripture. Okay, any other gentlemen? Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Any other other panelists um, with anything to add here? Okay, so we agreed then that life is precious, uh, given by God, and if there is an incident that produces a child, then um, that child, if at all possible, should be brought into the world with love. Okay.
Okay. Can I Let's... just say, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand. Sorry for the late response. I just want to say just one quick point. There are several very famous people. There are several people who are doing great and awesome work in the world who are products of rape. There are several who are making a very high contribution to the world. They, were, they, they, they are products of rape, but they have been a blessing to society. They have been a blessing to the world. They have made the world a better place. Suppose they were aborted. There are, there are some preachers who have won thousands of souls to the Lord yet they are products of rape. I heard one giving his experience that he was a product of rape and he was cast aside for a while, but thank God his parents brought him into the world. But through his ministry, so many thousands of souls have been won. So I am saying that God is able to make a good thing out of a bad thing. Yes. He's able to make a good thing out of a bad situation. And the child that you bring may be an absolute blessing to you and to the world. God bless you. Uh, also, um, very quickly, it, a question like this should um, let us know the importance of having a holistic ministry. Because, of course, um, situation like incest or rape, uh, things like those will have adverse mental and all sort of effects. So the church needs to be aware of these situations pre-existing as Pastor Douglas was saying, within our midst and therefore we need to have the different arms, ministerial arms, uh, counseling, um, Christian counseling and so forth to cater to those who may well have suffered from, from some of these issues. We need to have a holistic ministry because man is tripartite, is body, soul, and spirit. And these problems do exist. And we don't just look after the soul, we have to look after the well-being, all-round well-being of the individual. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, oh, Pastor Frank, Dr. Frank. This, uh, thank you, gentlemen, Dr. Reddy, Dr. Daly, uh, for your great insights. Uh, when we look at scripture, in terms of the notion of human life and the value of human life. Again, keeping at the core, humans are created in the image of God and each life has value. So if that is the, that's the cornerstone or the theological perspective from which we come. If we filter all societal norms and all these new assertions, technology, whatnot, if we put these upon all of this, upon scripture, we must look at it from the point of view of the value of the human life. Now, when we take a deeper dive into the context of the Judeo, because of course we are in cultures that are coming out of Judeo-Christian backgrounds and ethics and the way we live our lives. So when we look at scripture and we go back to the teachings as we found in the writings of Deuteronomy and different parts, of the, the Bible in the Old Testament. I've, I've been asked this before. So what about in cases where there's an issue with the mother's life versus the life of the unborn? What happens then? Uh, from that perspective, that is where again, the leader or leaders of the community of the Christian faith community sits with families. And again, from the point of view of scripture, help that individual to walk through the process biblically. It is never advisable to just get information from just any and anyone about this. The guidance of a good, solid Bible-believing leader, pastor, rabbi, uh, Christian leader, that will help the individual to, through this process. Uh, there are some case studies and pretty much all of the issues we've been discussing there's several cases that i'm aware of in terms of case studies and in light of my studies 
I've been able to study these case studies and see it from different perspective. For time, I will not dive into any or delve into any. Just to affirm, once again, keep at the core, the life has value created in the image of God. If a decision has to be made, it should never be made just at a whim, providing solid biblical. And there's a reason why I'm stressing biblical, because you can engage in Christian in counseling. And I can tell you, you can find any counselor that would support your position in any direction you want to go. Mm. But is it biblical? One, yes, of the other, one of the it's other things I will tell anybody any day, having done both the ethos of ministry and the practice of ministry, in terms of the ethics of ministry studies, whatnot, and carrying out ministry and dealing with people's lives in the real world. When anything involves the life of a child vis-a-vis -vis abortion, it is an issue that is not present and solved now. It is an issue that has generational effects. And again, I can tell you, just as Dr. Daly made reference to, Pastor Daly made reference to that case with that lady, I can tell you many other case studies. When young people find out certain things or adults find out certain things, it has serious ramification, hence the biblical guidance for it. Um, quickly, may I just pop back in a minute, please? Um, Madam Moderator. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Yes, I, I just, um, just something which I, popped up on the chat. Uh, I think, can I just get it back up? Uh, um, okay, I, I hear you, Dr. Reddy, but before we go, there, I did say that we, I don't know whether we have time to address. I did see where it asked about the spirit of rejection. Ah, okay, that's can right. we yes. leave that just at this time, okay. please, okay. because okay. it's yes. interesting yes. time. Uh, I, I do value the fact that people. I'm glad you saw it. I'm glad you uh, spotted it. Chiming. Yeah. Thank you so much. I did see that question, and I know that that's uh, the whole. All of these questions, if I may say, are very deep questions and questions that you could spend a long time. You could spend the whole panel just discussing these at length. But for just... the brevity of time and being able to address. Right now, I'm just going to do one more critical question, I believe, in ethics, and I'm going to move on because um, otherwise we're going to find that there are some things that we can't touch on. So I do apologize, Minister Rudo, another time, another place. <laughs> okay, right. So this question is going to be directed to Pastor Daly. And it's a very pertinent question in terms of what's happening now. And the question is, would you say that people who are taking the COVID-19 vaccine that they do not have faith in God. Pastor Daly. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, this is, um, this is quite a popular question these days because um, there's quite a bit of controversy over whether or not the vaccine should be taken. Uh, I would say that taking the vaccine is not, um, is not an indication of not having faith uh, because the truth of the matter is that medicines have been used in scripture. If we should um, look at uh, uh, the case of Hezekiah when he was about to die, it was... Um, Sorry, let me just um, fix my, my computer. is telling me that its battery is running low. I'm just going to click a switch. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yes, yeah, so Hezekiah was sick. And in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 7, Isaiah said, take a lump of figs. And they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. So God sometimes works through medicine. And um, you could also say that even taking the vaccine, this vaccine had a very short um, production period. Uh, this vaccine has been um, safely guarded against any lawsuits that could come to it. And just taking it might require some faith. <laughs> Taking the vaccine itself might require faith. So I would say that 
God, Jesus himself made medicine when he was um, healing a man's eyes. He made clay and put upon his eye, upon, upon the man's eyes. So God sometimes works through medicines. And remember that our beloved Dr. Luke was a physician and no doubt he had to use medicines. So I am saying that that is absolutely no indication of not having faith. And uh, it could be quite the contrary. So that is not a reason. I think that the, the other, the main issue that we should look at is we have been talking about abortions and my issue with the vaccine would be rather the fetal cells, despite the distance they say it is from the actual fetal cells. But I would have nothing to do with a vaccine that has fetal cells in it. And I would base that on, on, on my own moral convictions. And for that reason, I would prefer one that does not have in fetal cells. And that supports my faith in, in the morality that God prescribes. So it is not a matter of not having faith. It is a matter of getting well. But be careful how you get well, I would say. Be careful what you use to get well. Thank you. I think that's about all I could say on that matter. Thank you, Pastor Daly. Does anybody else want to comment on, because it's a hot potato subject, really. A lot of people right now are con uh, considering, I think, AstraZeneca, Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson. We hear the controversies in the news about certain ones and um, uh, their benefits and so on. And I know lots of church organizations have had um, their own roundtables to talk to um, the brethren as to what they should do. Does anybody else have any comments in this area? Uh, well, if I may quickly ask, the, 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 the key um, part to that question is, is it a lack of faith? And, and, and faith in who or faith in what? We know that for the most part, this is a manifestation of a lack of faith in the system or the systems or the, the governance. And perhaps um, we as church leaders or the church as an organization, an entity for change, because the church is, an, is a change agent. We are supposed to bring about systemic change to systemic problems. And the lack of faith is a lack of faith in the system. And it has its grounding in history and the experience of certain um, ethnic groups um, within the, the interaction with um, the other. So maybe as part of a positive spin-off to this pandemic, we need to work to bring about awareness and the scripture supports this, that all men are equal and should be treated as such, not on the basis of color or ethnicity or social standing and social status. So that, that, that um, deep seated, that systemic and endemic mistrust can be eradicated or, or at least we have some amelioration in how people think and perceive the system as working either against them or in their favor. So the lack of faith is not necessary. I, I would want to think it's not just to do with a lack of faith in God, but it is a lack of faith in the, the system or the people that administer the system. And we as people of God need to work on making sure we can create before I would especially like that to happen whilst I am still alive. We can work to bring about a level playing field, field where people feel that there are no undue conspiracies against them in terms of their existence as human beings with equal worth, equal value. That's my opinion. Lack of faith in what and in whom? Is it in Thank God you. or in the system? Thank you, Dr. We Reddy. need to work to clarify that. Dr. Douglas? I believe that this is an issue that 
from the, what it reveals and this pandemic has revealed, I believe it has revealed the role of the church in society in the, in the context of ethics. And, and we use the term Christian ethics, but ethics in gen general, because what's at play, and I love what Dr. Um, Reddy has said and Pastor Daly has said, the notion of faith versus the practice of the person's moral expressions. So uh, the, the statement that had been already made from a Christian perspective, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient, right? So as a Canadian citizen, I have the fundamental responsibility to preserve my life and the life of my family. So if I choose to go out and give uh, and get it and vaccinated myself, my wife and my family, and we do that as a community, in light of the church's say, that may not be a viewpoint that is going to be held up in the context of my ultra-modern, post-modern, ultra-modern Canadian society. And it's true for those of you who live in the UK and other parts of the world. When it comes to that perspective, however, I do believe that in this time, in this season, I believe that there is a learning opportunity for the church to be Absolutely. able to engage in the context of re not being reactive, because I do believe we're being reactive at this point, <laughs> but I do believe well, that sorry. the church should be more proactive and Absolutely. be taking the steps to address these social and ethical issues. So pastors should be preaching sermons and teaching on series Absolutely. in their local churches. And please permit me at the risk of sounding arrogant I, I have done this. I've done a, a whole six month series addressing these specific social issues in light of ministry, because we can't wait to react when these sisters, uh, issues, uh, these issues arise. In light of faith for us to then, on the other hand, look at someone and say that you don't have faith and you shouldn't be taking the vaccine. Also remember the individual may be dealing with a pre-existing condition that we are not aware of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In light of the individual, so again, where biblical counsel, wise counsel comes into the mix, and this is where it takes the support of a pastor sustained in the word, a Christian leader sustained in the word. This is where Pastor uh, uh, Sims Morgan comes in, Pastor Andre comes in, understanding that there are members in his congregation who understand the history of issues of vaccines and how they've been used negatively. Mm -hmm. But understanding the historical context, understanding the spiritual context and be able to bring together both. Once again, I do believe this is an opportunity for the church and the role of church in society to be able to take a proactive approach in addressing these social ethic issues. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. I would have asked Pastor Andre to chip in here, but because in the interest of time, I'm sure there'll be another opportunity for him um, to say something. Okay, we're going to move on to um, the broad area of leadership in the church, women. And uh, this question is going to be posed to Dr. Douglas with regards to the stance, the churchy stance on women as bishops and overseers. And I dare say we can link that to the other question where it asks about whether women should be silent in the church. Over to you, Dr. Douglas. I'd like for you as a group and for those who are listening to take the time to go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Acts chapter 20, Romans chapter 5, and there are several other passages. But let me just anchor my response in 1 Timothy chapter 2. So let me begin by addressing 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I begin by reading 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Actually, let me go back real quickly. First Timothy chapter two, verse one. First of all, then I urge that supplication and prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all peoples, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly 
and dignified in every way. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, which is a word-to-word -word transliteration of the Bible. I want to go down to verse 11. Let a woman learn quietly with submissiveness. Verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she shall be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. This is an extremely challenging passage, uh, passage as it relates to the exegesis behind it and the perspective people have taken. So there, at this point, there is a dominant role in terms of how passages like 1 Timothy chapter 2, 11 to 15 is to be understood. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34 and 35, how these passages should be understood. So let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, once again for context. Verse 34. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34. And this is what the word of the Lord says. As in, the as in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, as you listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 34 and 35, and 1 Timothy chapter 2, 11 to 15, right off the bat, if you take it at face value, you would quickly come to the, the, the conclusion that women should never speak in church. They should not have anything to say. By sub subsequent reasoning, it would go to the point where you could make a case, a biblical argument, that women should then not be leaders in the church, vis-a-vis -vis pastors, bishops, overseers, or any of those. Are we clear so far? Then if this is the case, it best behoove all of us as Christian leaders to be honest in the ethical assessment of scripture and the evaluation of scripture. There's a term that is used and it's that if a verse is taken, I remember one of my preaching professors said this years ago, if a verse is taken, just one verse of scripture or a simple passage is taken to form a doctrinal position, then it becomes problematic without assessing in the context from which this passage is connected. So then let me go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 closely, you'll notice from the very beginning, the first unit of 1 Timothy chapter 2 addresses the issue. Let's quickly go back. Addresses the issue of prayer and how prayer should be made. It says it should be made for all peoples. So if prayer should be made for all peoples, who are the only persons who are going to be praying? Should it only be men? Or it should be men and women or are involved? Let us be clear that the God who created humanity, I do not believe, in my opinion, that God would exclude more than 50% of those who have created being females to be excluding from praying for all peoples. So then in this regard, someone may say, well, it's okay for women to pray and to be able to in, be involved in other aspects of the church, but they should not be involved in the context of the ministry of the word vis-a-vis -vis teaching scripture, preaching scripture in the church, or from the perspective of leadership, being a pastor, an overseer, and a bishop. I'm going to permit me, without getting complicated, to delve a little bit into the decks a little bit further. If you look at the context in which Timothy is receiving this, first, who is writing it? It's Paul who is writing it. Paul writes to Timothy. Timothy is in Ephesus. 
Timothy's a young pastor, a young leader, a young pastor being a young bishop in the church. And Paul is writing to Timothy to help Timothy how to choose, select, and help to develop leaders for the church in Ephesus and in the region. Paul later on did the same thing to Titus in Crete. When Paul instructs Timothy, Paul is very cognizant of the context in which Timothy is doing ministry in Ephesus. Bear in mind that Timothy is doing ministry in Ephesus, but there's also other ministries that are being carried out throughout the region. All of that region of the then known world where the gospel is being proclaimed. So while Timothy is receiving this instruction, there are others that are involved in ministry similar to what Timothy is involved in and will later be involved in. Women such as Priscilla, women such as Junia. That's there are right. other women who were involved as Philippians tells us, Eutyche and Syntyche, Philippians chapter two, three and onwards. So Paul had in mind while he's writing to Timothy, there are other women that are involved in ministry. So what is Paul saying here to Timothy? He's not taking the position, let me go back to what I said earlier, prescriptive versus descriptive. Paul is addressing Timothy in this context, in the context of 1 Timothy 2, the context of Ephesus in which he's doing ministry. At the time he's writing to Timothy, there are tensions involved in the regions of Ephesus. A very similar situation has happened in Corinth when Paul is writing to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 34 and 35, Paul is addressing the gift of the spirit and the gifts of tongues and interpretation of tongues and the practice of ministry and how church should be carried out in decency and order. And of course, he had made reference in 1 Corinthians 11 as it relates to the role of women and their decor and dress and so on. So bearing in mind the first context we must understand, Paul understands the context of culture. You understand the political climate, you understand the social climate, and he understand the context of which Timothy is going to do ministry. By and large, this is not something new. So let's go back again to Paul as it relates to the context. Let me draw your attention back to if he, uh, rather Acts chapter 15. The church gathers in Acts chapter 15 in Jerusalem, as recorded in Acts chapter 15. And they're in Jerusalem, and they're addressing the issue of the role of those who are coming to faith in Christ and whether they're required to be involved in circumcision. Paul makes an argument against circumcision. But if we flip the scripture over to, First Corin uh, to, rather, to Acts chapter 16, the scripture tells us that Paul meets this young leader, Timothy. And one of the first thing Paul does is to have Timothy circumcised. Now, if you ask me, is Paul conflicted in his views? Or Paul is understand the context. Paul understands the context that Timothy is going to be ministering. And so even though Paul, from a theological perspective, believes that those who are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, that's why I give the argument in Acts chapter 15, should not be forced to, per, to undergo circumcision because the grace of God is at greater at work. But he, he also understands that the context of the culture of ministry of Timothy would warrant that Timothy be circumcised. Are you following me? Let's bring this back to the role of women in leadership. In certain parts of the world, because of the cultural dynamics that you as some of our women listening that are now living in, culture becomes a very dominant role. So should it be that the scripture should be used to sustain scripture, uh, culture, or should it be that the, uh, the scripture should be used to sustain the biblical meaning of what the Bible really means vis-a-vis -vis the role of women in leadership? So let's look at it a little bit deeper. If we go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we look at the context in which Paul is writing, go back to 1 Timothy 2 and look at verse 11. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority or a, over a man. The word authority that is used here in the original Greek is not the word exousia, exousia, which is often used to, in, to mean power, authority, ab ab ability, or enablement. 
It's a different word. In fact, Paul uses an, a very unique word that is a very close connection to the root of the word exousia. And it's not Greek class, so I'm not going to get into the depth of it. And the word he uses goes beyond just the understanding of authority as we know it of control, of subservience, hierarchical structure. What Paul is actually saying in this text to Timothy, bear in mind the context of in which you're ministering, understanding what is taking place in Ephesus at the time. And when you then carry out the role of ministry, because you're establishing leadership and you don't want to create a problem, at this point, allow the women to learn in the context here. Paul was not prescribing for us to take this specific text and to relegate women to the position of subservience of leadership. Amen. So then when we escalate this forward and we get to 1 Timothy 3, you may then ask, Pastor Douglas, so why did he specifically mention the role of men and men once again in the formation of overseers? The word overseer comes from the word that points out, it's the term episkopos in the Greek. And the word overseer means in its administrative role, one who has oversight over the church or different dynamics of the church. So whether it's a region, a local church, in the context of episcopos. So in this context, Pastor Andre is the episcopos of his local church. He's the pastor of the local church. In the context of the role in which he served, he has full oversight of the church. He carries out the role of administration. He carries out the role of didacticals or teaching. And he carries out the role of proclamation or preaching. So then in, the pra in this way, the role Pastor Andre plays, Pastor Daly plays as pastors, the Episcopal's role, they're carrying out the role of a shepherd. That's another word that is used in other parts of scripture. When you look at these roles, they're not tied to gender. They're not tied to gender. Let me say it again. They're not tied to gender, nor are they tied to sex. So where does this come from? So if we go back and look at how gender has been used to push women down and take control of women throughout the churches, what we have developed over the years, we have developed an idea of what's called complementarianism. And complementarianism mm -hmm. is the notion that the role of women should be complementary to men in the ah. church. So women should complement the role of the <laughs> episcopals or the pastor and the presbyterius, the presbytery, but they should not have a dominant role. Complementarianism is, a, is, a, is the understanding that is often promulgated by mainline churches and many main leaders. Many years ago, John Piper and Wayne Grudem wrote a book and the, the book in its premise, and you can go online and search for it, the book addresses the complementary perspective to counter what was called feminism taking over the church. Now, but I want to also be clear that some of the very arguments that has often been used throughout history to subjugate women in leadership are some of the very arguments that were used because how many know that you can use the Bible to do anything you want? For example, Absolutely. Absolutely. let me tell you this, that the Bible was used to validate slavery. slavery yeah. And there are people in mainline churches that sustain that for many years. Probably still do. Slaves, obey your masters. But mm. in the same breath of using Paul's <laughs> terms, they negated what was written in Exodus chapter 21, that the person who owns another man should be killed. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Read indeed. it for yourself. So then yeah. you can take the scripture and say what you want to say about it. So the people who push the idea cannot be selective about scripture. So then how do we understand the role of women in churches? Going back to your question. Should women be teachers and preachers. There's a word that is used and the word is used in the context of Greek language and it's transliterated as protesis, protesis. There are other expressions to it, but in light of this, it means to stand and to deliver. When we look at the women who Paul engage in their leadership, and I'm gonna say something about Jesus in a minute. We saw Priscilla, we saw Junia, 
we saw Eudike, Sintike, and there are many other women. Paul, in his interaction with them, he not only had them in a complementary role, he had them in the role of prostasis, where they were literally standing, preaching, teaching, and they are clear in the council of God. If the word episcopos that we translate to bishop, pastor, overseer, once again, episcopal in its administrative role is an overseer, oversight of a church or a region, but in its role of shepherding, that role of a shepherd, women who are permitted to proclaim the counsel of God, then if by argument, the argument can be made that a woman can be ordained as a bishop in light of the administrative role she carries out. The woman can be ordained as a pastor to lead in a church. If we put the cultural biases aside and do a biblical and a correct exegetical assessment of these scriptures, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 14, we'll walk away from a, not just culture, from a biblical and exegetical place. Let me conclude on this. Jesus, understanding the role of women in society, I've often wondered when he was on earth, St. Luke chapter eight, Dr. Luke takes the time to list the name of the women who supported Jesus. Yes. If you look at it, you will look at the women and the role they played. Jesus had women who were ordinary women, but he also had women, when I say had women, I mean support in the ministry for which he came. <laughs> there was nothing nefarious. He was not a cult leader. They supported the ministry. And the scripture is clear as it lists, and Dr. Luke lists in Luke 8, these yep. names, you will see clearly how women of different socioeconomic status and strata That'd were utilized true. in the ministry of Jesus. The second thing I'd like to point out from the life and ministry of Jesus as it relates to the role of women is this. When Jesus was raised from the dead and the women showed up at the tomb, my question has always been, Jesus did not need to tell these women to go back and to carry the message. He could have done it himself. But I do believe that Jesus chose, in my opinion, not prescriptive. I believe Jesus chose through his divine design, just like he did in the life of when he delayed in coming to Lazarus, his grave. And he made it clear he delayed because there was a purpose. The word telios or end is used. I believe that Jesus Christ in his ministry on earth, he utilized examples to give us the notion, though not specific and explicit, he gave us the understanding that he allowed women to be involved in the ministry that he was involved in a different socioeconomic level. And if we look at Paul's ministry, by and large, holistically, he did the same. So by extension, when we look at, should women be teachers and preachers? Should women be pastors, bishops, and overseer? If we correctly provide a correct exegesis of scripture, biblical exegesis, considering the social context, the biblical context, the cultural, ge geographical context, and so on, we will lead to conclude that women are not precluded from leadership in the church at all levels. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. Um, in the interest of time, guys, I mean, I, I wouldn't even try to summarize what Dr. Douglas said because that was a, a, a Sunday morning uh, service that I would have been used to some time ago. But it really amplifies for us that we can't take um, a verse or a passage and create a doctrine from that and that women are absolutely a part of what um, God's plan is for the kingdom of God in whatever category that may be. So I know Pastor David would like to say something, but time is against me. There are three questions that absolutely need some kind of um, response and we are running out of time. So please forgive me, Pastor Daly. Um, 
And I thank Dr. Douglas for really comprehensively, and I'm sure there could be other things added. I, I do appreciate that, thank you. Right, this question um, is to um, Pastor Andre, because he hasn't said very much, and then the other two questions are open. And so, gentlemen, you're free to come in and to give um, whatever you would like to say in that area. This one is to Andre, Pastor Andre. Leaders should have a certain level of integrity. In, uh, this is crucial for leadership, and there must be accountability to their head of leadership. So this question is to Pastor Andre. Leaders, it's talking about integrity and about their responsibility to those who are over them in the Lord. Pastor Andre. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I would say leaders, my notes on this, leaders having a level of integrity. Um, integrity, I would say, refers to one being reliable, one being honest, one being trustworthy, one being dependable, and as a leader, having a level of integrity, we should practice what we preach. So in other words, we, we're not, uh, leaders shouldn't be telling people to do certain things and they themselves are not doing it. So it should be that we practice what we preach. Important for leaders to own up to their own mistakes, knowing that we're not gonna get it right all of the time. We're, we're not going to be 100% all of the time, but we must realize where we've gone wrong, where we've fallen short, um, be able to own up to our mistakes as opposed to hiding them and then maybe blaming others, not taking responsibility, um, wanting to pass the blame onto other people. So I think that it's very important that leaders um, with integrity practice what they preach, own up to their mistakes, um, and not blame others and take responsibility. In, record, in, in reference to that, Proverbs chapter 10, Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 9, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Um, whatever goes on in the dark, will always come out in the light at some point or another. Um, Kings nine and four, and I'll wrap it up there. In, uh, up there. And if thou wilt walk before me, first Kings nine and four, and if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee, and will keep my statutes and my judgment. So leaders um, walking with integrity and also having respect for leadership because just because you are a leader doesn't mean that you don't um, have another, every pastor needs a pastor, every bishop needs a bishop. You've got to have that covering. You can't be left exposed. Um, so you've got to have somebody that you are accountable to and you respect them just as you respect them as your leader, then also somebody's respecting you as their leader. And so, and so, and so it goes on. I hope that answered that question. Thank you. And um, does anybody want to say anything very briefly about that? Because there are two critical questions that um, people have sent in and clearly they would like some answers. So does anybody want to say anything about that? No, I'm just thinking of Paul, he, he, you know, he always emphasized the need to, to, and he used himself as example as well, the need to live um, so as not to bring the gospel into disrepute or to, to bring um, the Thanks. kingdom into, into reproach. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, leadership by example is essential. I like to think of the, the centurion. You have to 
be under authority or learn what it means to be under authority before you can begin to exercise authority. You have to learn humility before you can learn to lead. And the, the centurion is a good example of showing deference to, to authority and leadership. Learn to be subject to authority that you may in due time be able to exercise authority. They work together. Thank you. That, that really helps in that area. I think um, one of the keys I took away from Pastor Andre is that um, integrity is really important and what um, we consider to be wrapped up sometimes when we look even in our um, political climate and um, some of the things that have come to light, some things that came back in 1990, 95 or whatever it is, somebody's resurrected it and it's become a problem. So what is done in the dark? Um, will come to light. So as uh, uh, ministers and people of God, we want to keep integrity, especially our leaders. Okay, two more questions, and these are open questions. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Thank you, Pastor Andre. Um, this one was sent in, and I'm just going to read it as we had it, and it is open, so I'm asking all of our panelists to listen and to please um, give your prayerful response. I have a question about my marriage. We've been separated for four years now. He's not taking my calls when I call him. In February, he sent all my belongings, which I left at our marital home, back to my mother's house. Now my question is, can I keep praying for my marriage? I don't want to quit as long as the Lord has given me the assurance to keep on Praying. So that question is to all of our panelists, and um, you can unmute your mics and um, answer um, at will, um, obviously respecting the other person if somebody comes in before you. Okay, do I, do I need to pick on somebody? Pastor Daly, what do you think? I was just unmuting. <laughs> yes, um, yes, the question of marriage and especially the breakup of marriage is a very hard question and it's a very difficult circumstance to be in. And I like the, the way this question is put. It, it gives me an idea that this person wants to fight for her marriage. That's the, that's the impression I'm getting from the question. They want to fight for their marriage. And they indicate also that they feel that the Lord is giving them the assurance to keep on praying. And based on that, I would say that, yes, by all means, keep on praying. God is still able. It may take a long time. It it may look sometimes as if it is hopeless, but your persistent prayers can make a supreme difference. I would say that while doing so, seek support, seek help, seek um, those who can bear you up with their prayers and also give you encouragement and support because it will be hard at times, with the, the person not being there. And especially that you seem to be getting the cold shoulder, so to speak. But I would say that by all means, keep on praying as long as you are able and as long as God is giving you this indication to keep on praying. Fight for your marriage because God is still able to transform lives. God is able to hear and answer those prayers. And I have heard of stories of persons who have prayed. I heard of the story of one woman who prayed for 16 years for her husband to be saved and to return. And God, after 16 years, answered that prayer and saved that person and brought him back to the family and 
he, he became such a blessing and she was able to, to come to church and testify of what a blessing God has, what a miracle God has wrought in the gentleman's life. So I believe in the power of prayer. And I have heard of the instance, instances where God has worked on behalf of persons in this fashion. So I'm saying, I would say, yes, continue to pray and get the support, get the help that you need. And those times when it becomes difficult, the songwriter said, when the days are weary and the long nights dreary, not only that, know that Jesus cares, but also know that there are others that you can lean on who care also, who can give you the support that they need. So yes, God bless you as you continue to fight. I'm sorry that we can't help you to pray right now today on this matter, but I, I will be praying for you. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Daly. Dr. Reddy, what say you? <laughs> Uh, sometimes, you know, it is said that prevention is the best cure. Um, by all means, I would sanction that you continue to pray. Uh, prayer does work. And um, at the same time, try and find out. I talk about the ministry earlier, the, the deliverance ministry earlier. Try and get to the root of the matter as well. Because um, if you only apply topical medication without diagnosing the root cause of the matter, how did things get um, uh, so pear-shaped? How did things end up the way they are? Get to the root of the matter. Sometimes we are trying to uh, fix a physical malady or look at the physical symptoms and the ailments. The physical symptoms are there. Yes, he has left home. Um, I am being blanked or ignored. He sent back my belongings physically. What, what are his problems? And what are my problems? And to what extent did I engender that schism? It's a schism within the, the relationship. To what extent did, did he engender those schisms? Until you get to the root of the matter, it could be an underlying spiritual um, demonic attack, demonic force you are not going to be able to solve the problem. They talk about binding and loosing. If you don't know the root, did you, the disciples had asked Jesus, how is it that we couldn't have dealt with this issue with the little boy that was epileptic? And Jesus said, because this kind, go it not out by prayer and fasting. So sometimes there is a kind, there is a kind of spirit underlying the issue. And we, we have to first identify that issue and be able to bind that spirit and lose something positive in its place. Get to the root of the matter. Otherwise we are daydreaming about solving problems. Please. Okay, thank you, Dr. Reddy. Dr. Douglas. One of the things I've learned over the years and I've heard the word from Dr. Phil and listen to the context. You cannot change what you do not acknowledge. That's right. You cannot change what you do not acknowledge. Let me borrow that from the world of counsel and counseling and bring this into the context of ministry and our personal lives. Dr. Reddy, Pastor Daly, very much correct, Pastor Andre, um, very much correct. You can pray, I can pray about an issue as it relates to marriage, but in the context of honesty, how did I get here in my union? Mm -hmm. What contribution did I make to end up here? I truly believe that Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, really, really, Ephesians chapter 4 and chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 4 and 5, he starts in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15. And if you follow that, and he takes it over, Ephesians 4, 15, but speak the truth in love, and goes on to tell us what would happen, Ephesians chapter 4 onwards. And then when we get to Ephesians chapter 5, he encourages the community of believers, Ephesians 5, 25 onwards, to help us, whether in our marriage or in ch church conflicts, how to deal with these issues. So in Ephesians chapter 5, 25 onwards, and then he addressed the issue of, in Ephesians 5, 25, 26, he makes it very clear. 
be angry and do not sin. And he goes on to say, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Understand the dynamics of what has taken place in light of, of uh, Ephesians chapter four, rather, Ephesians chapter four, in terms of those conversations as to how communication is taking place in the union. So while we pray in our union, in our marriages, be willing to be honest, open and transparent. If you did or said something that contributed to the present status of the marriage, you cannot take the position of being a victim. Ephesians chapter five, verse 33, Paul ends the message on the theme, wives, husbands, love your wives as you love yourself. Earlier on, he said, and as also Christ loved the church. But he also says in Ephesians 5, 33, and why see to it that you reverence, Old King James Version, reverence, meaning respect your husband. So it is a two-way street. I'm going to say this, and I want you to hear me. I've shared it with many couples over the years. I have often said, and please understand me clearly, Ephesians 5, 33, I will not blame the, pace, the blame on females, the wife in the union. I will interject a point for thought. The wife is called to respect her husband. The husband is called to love her wife. I love his, love her husband rather, sorry. However, in the context of the marital relationship, if there's disrespect that starts to happen from the wife to the husband, it becomes a telltale sign as the strength of where the marriage goes next. Because in the context of marital relationship, when a husband feels disrespected in any way, his perspective towards his wife of loving her starts to shift. From the point of view of the husband of loving his wife, he will use that as an, as an excuse to not love his wife because his wife has disrespected him. Do you see the, the pieces? And it can go back and forth. How does, it, how does that solve? This is where honesty, ownership comes in. Prayer, pray, but be honest in fixing the situation. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I can see there, if, if I can like quickly recap there, um, Dr. Frank said you can't change what you don't acknowledge, so you need to deal um, with that. And uh, Dr. Reddy said that you really can't keep applying a topical uh, application to where there may be something underlying. So we need to deal with the root of the matter. And Pastor Joseph said, I believe once you've taken these steps, then you can apply prayer to be able to get out of any situation once you start following. It's like anything in life. There are steps that you need to follow. If you're going to cook something, you don't end up with the end product straight away. You have to start somewhere and begin uh, to create that recipe. So it's the same in this question. So I'm hoping um, that the individual that asked this question, and um, we obviously feel for you because we know that you want your marriage to be successful. If you can apply some of these areas, have a look, go back, have a look at what needs to be acknowledged, what is the root of the matter. And if you can pray and seek the support of others to help you to pray on this matter. Now, this has gone way over the time that we should have done, but we have one more question. It is an open question. And as I can say here, as they say, um, as a disclaimer, that it is a, a question that regards marriage and sexual in intimacy. So I'm going to read the question as it is. And I would expect um, for Dr. Douglas to be able to give us some response. And I'd also like to hear something from the other gentlemen as well, um, if they so desire. Now, this question states, um, does the Bible give a specific way that married couples can have um, sex? What about if one party or the either party wants to experiment within the relationship, such as oral or anal sex? And there is one more question that's tied to that, if we can have a look at that as well, that says, uh, what do women do 
when their husbands withhold sexual intimacy and turn to masturbation, porn, strippers, and other things for excitement. So I don't know whether I need to um, say that again, but if you gentlemen, I know it's a little sensitive, but this is clearly an area that um, people need some clarification on, I dare say it's important um, to the body of Christ. So if I can ask um, our panelists, maybe Dr. Douglas to go first, and um, if we can make it brief, Dr. Douglas, because time is against us. Thank you. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. In this context, Paul, uh, rather the writer of the Hebrews, uh, made it clear, marriage is to be held in honor among every other relationship. The marriage bed should be left undefiled, mean not be infringed upon, because God will judge anything that is done in the context of sexually immoral or adulterous practices in the context of the marriage. Cultures always impose itself upon the marital union. When we look at scripture in the book of Songs of Solomon, we see the sexual relationship expressed between a man and a woman. We understand the context of our culture has come in on this. One thing that the couple must be honest with is what is the motivation that would bring the relationship to a place where someone in the relationship feels the motivation, the compulsion, the desire to engage in an act that is going to be counter to the word of God vis-a-vis the marital relationship. So simply put, Ask yourself the question, male or female, why am I motivated to do this? The word lust and the word desire, as used in the English Bible, it's coming from the same Greek word, epithumia. Lust is the negative aspect of it. Desire is the positive. My wife of 29 years, is it possible for me to lust after her? Or is it possible for me to have desire for her? So if a relationship has declined to the point where there is the involvement of masturbation and the involvement of pornography in the involvement of other sexual practices that are not sustaining the marital union, it should now be at a point where the parties involved honestly look at themselves in light of scripture, seek godly counsel and work this through. If someone is asking to engage in a sexual practice that is counter to the word of God, and that is going to be counter to the other party, the individual ought to respect the other party. In summary, if sexual practices in marriages, sexual expressions in the union, vis-a-vis the use of pornography or involving other activities is counter to the word of God, it is biblically wrong and should not be engaged in. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. Um, Pastor Daly, are you hiding behind the screen or are you... (laughs) 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 Right. um... So the question comes, does the Bible give a specific way that married couples can have sex? And what about if either party wants to experiment within their relationships? Well, Dr. Frank has um, really gone over the the motivation and I would agree with that. Um, What would motivate this kind of thing? And the Bible, is not specific on the sexual act, but we can consider the the purpose of our our various body parts, what they were made for, and we can come to a conclusion thereby. And uh, there are certain body parts that have been made (laughs) for certain purposes. And I think that we go against God's 
um, purposeful design in um, going outside of the purpose for which they were made. So that is one aspect we, we could consider. But there's no easy answer to a question like that. The Bible does not give specifics. And the, the one important thing to do is to ensure that you do not do anything that you're not comfortable with. Well, um, if you look at um, Romans, I think it's Romans 14, 23, where the Apostle Paul was speaking about meats offered to idol. He said that you should not go against your conscience. You mm. should not go against your conscience. So if you feel uncomfortable, um, th there's a saying that if in doubt, leave it out. <laughs> in doubt, leave it out. So if you are not comfortable with that, and your, your, your conscience is um, troubling you when it comes to these things, you should not do it. Don't go against, don't violate your own conscience. And of course, in the second question, it is quite obvious that the use of porn and strippers for excitement is definitely ruled out by the scriptures, as Dr. Frank has said. Um, it, 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 it's, it comes under the classification of uncleanness and um, it should not be practiced. It, sex is a very sacred act and it, 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 there, there, there can be spirits involved and there can be a transference of spirits also, right. demonic spirits. So therefore we have to be very careful what we engage in. So that's what I would say um, for it, given the, the time that we have. God bless. Thank you very much, Pastor Daly, Dr. Douglas. Um, some really clear and concise responses there and um, telling us that marriage is honorable and sexual immorality is a problem. So as Pastor Dr. Frank said, if you know, why are you motivated toward this? and has your relationship declined? And uh, Pastor Joseph, Pastor Daly said, God has a purposeful design for your body and we don't want to move towards what is considered to be unclean. And you have to be comfortable and feel that you are within the will of God. So I'm hopeful that those two um, answers there, which I think were very clear, very specific, and hit um, the target as to what you can expect in your intimate relationships within marriage. Clearly to say, this is not speaking to those people who are single. If you are single, these may be questions that you might consider when you get married but for right now these are not things that you should be touching with a 10-foot pole you should not be um, finding yourself um dealing with strippers masturbation or anything like that we want to draw closer to god um in this state now before i'm just about to close up is there anything that any of our panelists would like to say just before we wrap up today. Pastor Andre, is there anything that you'd like to say today? Um, not really. Um, everything's really been covered. Um, uh, so um, but hopefully, hopefully there, there will be um, a part two, or obviously this will be a, a, an ongoing thing, maybe, I don't, I don't know. Um, because obviously there's a lot of different questions that need to be answered and, and to look at things to, to more depth. Obviously, we, we're always going to have this enemy of time, um, but obviously there's a lot of questions that people um, have. So hopefully we'll be able to get the chance, uh, even if it's not um, us as the, same, as the same panelists, but even if these um, questions and things that also come up in the chat, um, they, they, we'll be able to look at them at another time. Thank you very much, Pastor Andre. Dr. Reddy, the final word to you. Oh, that is such a great honor. I'll be very brief. Uh, 
just to say how much I agree with Dr. Douglas, um, a verse without a context, a, a text without a context is just a pretext. So we have to look at the background, historical, cultural, and the rest of it. I think it is significant that um, God, when he took woman from man, took her from the ribs, the side, uh, that she would walk beside him and not behind him or underneath him. And strange enough, the same Paul who wrote that um, uh, admonition to Timothy, he himself said um, to the Galatians, you see, when we are in Christ, we are neither Jews nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. We are all one in Christ, you see. And um, I think it was Elena Frey who once said, for God-fearing, intelligent, spirit-filled women, upon whom God has set his seal in their ministry, to have to sit and listen to men haggle over the matter of their place in the ministry is humiliating to say the very least. And the final word, um, uh, May Elena Frey also said, God Almighty is no fool. He has no second class citizens in heaven. I said without all rev with, I said with all reverence, would he fill a woman with the Holy Spirit, endow her with the ability, give her a vision of souls and then tell her to sh sit down and shut her mouth? No, I think not. So uh, as, as I want to commend you for a good job, uh, you could fool me that you are not seasoned in this thing. You did a really excellent job, top marks. More of the same, thank you very much. High praise Dr. Reddy, I receive it. Thank you so very much. Uh, Dr. Douglas, just before I come over to you, my closing remarks, I want to say thank you to everyone. I know we've gone a little bit over the time, but I think you can agree with me that the, and the subject matter was very rich, very needful, and that um, it doesn't matter where you are today, you can take something away from this that will help you with your onward journey as a child of God. I want to say thank you so much to the panelists, um, Dr. Douglas, Dr. Reddy, Pastor Joseph Daly, and Pastor Andre Sims Morgan. Virtual class. Thank you. Thank I you. appreciate you guys so very much today and um, being able um, to come together. Um, we're living in really different times. This is a virtual platform. I do believe moving forward that perhaps people will be engaging in more virtual platforms of this nature where they will be able to discuss. So the times have gone where we could say, well, I'm in one country and I'd like you to minister, but you're in another country. There are now opportunities available for us to be able to use technology. God has given us this means of being able to connect one with another. And I am so privileged today to be amongst this August body of gentlemen and being able to hear what they're saying today. I've um, taken some stuff away from my, for myself. I hope that those on the platforms listening in the Zoom room, those that are listening uh, via Facebook, that you are taking something away from this today and that it will help you to be able to um, navigate some circumstances in your life, which we will all face. God bless you. God bless you, gentlemen. God bless you, everyone that took part today. And um, I think that's it. I don't think I've forgotten anything. Remember that we do have our uh, service uh, commemorating five years of ministry, Kingdom Praying Women 365, under the leadership of Minister Marcia Sims Patrick. That will be on at um, 4 p.m. Uh, American time. I will be coming to you, Dr. Douglas. 4 p.m. Um, uh, North American time. I'm not sure what time. I think it's 9 p.m. in Europe. The UK. In the yep. UK. Yeah. And I, I believe other times in South Africa, Nigeria, and some of our other places where people will be joining. You know what time it is. You've been on for the last two nights, and it's been a tremendous blessing. Uh, Pastor Daly rocked the house. Um, Pastor Andre Sims Morgan came up behind, took the baton and began to run. Tonight we look forward to another dynamic uh, display of God at work through the ministry of Dr. Reddy as he comes to bring a word. And tomorrow we are looking to the culminating um, message um, through God's servant, Dr. Um, Frank Douglas. So I appreciate you all. At this time, 
I haven't forgotten, there's something else here. I'm gonna ask um, Dr. Douglas to pray and to close us out. But before he does that, I know that he has some um, books and material that will be useful um, to everybody. Um, I want to thank, before I forget, everybody behind the scenes, all the admin, Lady Melody and uh, Minister Claudette and everybody behind the scenes, um, uh, Deaconess Gelly, everybody that's been doing their part, not only for today, but throughout the whole conference. It's been our first one and there have been glitches along the way, but God has been so good. We're so grateful. And um, so all the people that have helped and been organizing and working behind it, even helping today for us to be able to put this on, God bless you. Thank you so much. Your labor will not be in vain. At this time, I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Douglas just to tell us about the books and to close us out in prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Valerie. Uh, for those of you who are interested in further reading, uh, further study, uh, there's some material that I will be passing on to Minister Marcia Sims Patrick, and she will send those out to you, or you can access those. I strongly encourage, especially those of you who are women leaders, as senior leaders, uh, to pursue these pastors, male or female, to take some time to do these readings. Very helpful in terms of some of the social ethics issues we cover and to give you the depth as it relates to some of the topics that will help you in your ministry. Could we pray? Heavenly Father, it is in the name of your son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that we do come before your presence this afternoon, this morning, this evening, wherever time of the world, wherever we are. We thank you for these, time, these hours together. We thank you for the ministry of your word that takes effect in us. And we thank you that all that you've done will bear fruit. I thank you for the panelists. I thank you for Pastor Daly. I thank you for Pastor Andre. I thank you, Lord, for Dr. Reddy. I thank you for Minister Sims Patrick and her team, the entire team. For time, I'll not call their names. But I thank you, Lord, for the vision you've given this great woman of God and for the passion of ministry. I thank you that you've used her, Lord, over the past five years. And I believe and I speak prophetically that you will continue to utilize your daughter for the work of the ministry. Father, nothing will hinder her. Nothing will come in her way. But you will lead your daughter forward. And so in this very short prayer, I want to give you the glory, the praise, and the honor for her life. And the ministry you've called her to. And the team that you've used her and guided her life with. I pray your blessings upon them. Thank you once again for today. I pray for all who have heard uh, the recordings now and in the future, that they shall be blessed. Lives shall be transformed. Salvation shall come through. Families shall be transformed. Ministries yes. shall be transformed. And you shall get the glory, the praise, and the honor. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise amen. the Lord. Thank you, guys. Big hand, everybody, virtual clap. Thank you so much. God bless you as we close out this session. And we will see you later today for our prayer and ministry endeavor at 4 p.m. U.S. time. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. It has been a privilege, sir.